Thank you. That's mostly sarcastic, the warning on that slide. But if not, thank you for buying a gold or silver passport to sit in the first couple of rows. Can't hear you. How about now? There we go. We that good, good, good. Oh, good. I didn't have enough booming import to get my message across. That's the important part. Little bit about me. I'm a cloud economist, two words that no one can define, which is sort of awesome. Uh, I spend a fair bit of community time helping build up the open guide to AWS, which is an open source GitHub project where we point out all the 10,000 tips and tricks that people wish we knew before they hit us in the face with respect to Amazon. And in my spare time, I write a weekly newsletter called Last Week in AWS, where I gather up news from Amazon's ecosystem and then make fun of it, which apparently opens doors. Who knew? And more to the point, I live tweet a number of talks, including this one right now. So if you want to see the director's cut, feel free to follow me on Twitter and watch me make fun of myself from multiple angles. And none of this is relevant to my talk. So that's what I do. Let's talk about what I don't do. I'm going to leave these logos up for a second here. And I want to be very clear that these are impressive companies, impressive names. They build credibility. They confer a sense of gravitas to anything that I say. Now, I want to be clear. I don't work at any of these companies. But strangely, that doesn't matter. Because by leaving these logos up, you're going to start to believe that I'm speaking with the authority of these companies. I mean, imagine what my production infrastructure probably looks like. <laughs> it is goddamn paradise. Now think about what your environment looks like. It is a shattered hellscape. How are you even still in business? Pack it in, give up, go home, raise goats instead. OK, that put, we shore up my credibility a little bit more. There we go. Now, obviously, I am far better at running infrastructures than your team is, because I theoretically might work at one of these companies. And that's kind of messed up. And this got me thinking for a little while, until I saw a talk last year that convinced me to build this talk. It was at a DevOps days. This was the actual talk blurb. And credit where due, it was a great speaker, great talk. It was subtle. It was nuanced. There was nothing wrong with the talk. I want to be very clear on this. And the speaker made some excellent points that, to be frank, sort of sailed over the heads of a good proportion of the audience. And it had some great lines in it. For example, at Netflix, developers have root in production. Now, I admit, I gasped at this. You may gasp at this. Please, gasp. There we go. There is audience participation. And the reason that this worked is because they trust people to do the right thing. The, doing that makes sense if you start with the right premises. OK, that's great. It makes sense here. And the reason this works is it comes down to their, inter their internal cultural principle of freedom and responsibility. And this stuff sounds incredibly addicting the first time that you hear this. And the guy next to me is talking about, yeah, I'm going to give uh, my developers root in production, too. It was amazing. It's like, yeah. And I sneak a look at his band name tag and see where he works. <laughs> a bank? <laughs> OK, excuse me. I have some changes to make to my banking choices. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, so. What happened there? Either he missed something or I did. But what? We'll get back there. This seems like an opportune time for us to talk about the cultures of the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Islands, uh, more specifically in the late 1930s, early 1940s. So war has broken out on a global scale. And suddenly, their islands have become staging areas for the largest uh, militaries that the world had ever seen. Uh, this is true, by the way. This is not me making some snarky, sarcastic point or making facts up. Well, I'm making sarcastic points, but I digress. And these people hadn't seen anything like this before, because you effectively have a relatively peaceful, not heavily trafficked area, 
and now massive amounts of war supplies are being dropped in virtually overnight to airports that had sprung up to handle this. Airport goes up, supplies come in, and this happened repeatedly. So they did what any reasonable tech startup does here in San Francisco. They went to Hacker News to rebuild everything from first <laughs> principles. So okay, we see airfields getting built and then supplies come in. Okay, bounty from the skies, how do we make this go? Okay, got it. And they built models of airports and runways and planes figuring that that's what inspired these things to show up. And it kind of didn't work so well. This became known as a cargo cult, and yes, this is real. What happened was that they wound up confusing cause and effect. It wasn't that the airports sprung up and supplies came in. The airport sprung up because the supplies needed somewhere to go. It wound up in a scenario where they started cherry picking from what they saw due to incomplete information and hoped for similar outcomes. So let's bring that metaphor back around. Devoid of context, we are all inclined to do things like this. And these islanders were not stupid. They just didn't have complete information. And the person from the bank sitting next to me also wasn't stupid. But the Islanders missed the larger context of World War II and its accompanying logistics. And the banking person next to me missed the larger context of Netflix's constraints. There are good things in all of these talks that you'll see, but you have to apply context to some extent. So going back to the points that were made in that talk, Let's fill in some missing context that the person sitting next to me missed. In fact, I wound up making up some slogans for Netflix based upon conversations I've had with people who currently and formerly used to work there. You can have these. If you work at Netflix, feel free to take these and slap them on. It turns out that it's a lot easier to trust developers in production if you don't hire anyone with less than a decade of experience working in those environments. Uh, who here has been a junior at some point and broke production? <laughs> if your hand isn't raised, I don't believe you. <laughs> exactly. Everyone has a story about this. Mine was, it was my first Linux admin job and I was copying around an rsync command that I didn't really understand because it's rsync. And okay, well, copy this out of a staging environment and, I learned what the delete flag does. Staging, not that bad, except someone had left the production NetApp mounted there. That's taking a long time to complete. Oh my god. And I run and shriek for help, and that is why that became known as the DevOps signal. It was great. And, <laughs> and the disaster was mostly contained. We caught it before it did too much damage. And a couple days go by, and I'm called to sit into the VP of engineering's office. And it's like, oh, cool, this is, this is the time I got fired. And he's like, do you know what you did? Yeah, yeah. Is it ever going to happen again? No. Well, not like that anyway, but I have some interesting <laughs> ideas for how I can improve it. Yeah. He's like, cool, just wanted to make sure you're aware and you're learning from this. Great job, keep it up. That's one of those moments that sticks with you. It, that's the whole point of blameless postmortems. And I learned a lot from that. I'm not nearly as junior or honestly as careless as I was back then. And back then, Netflix wouldn't have hired me. Uh, they might now, except for this talk where I'm putting the boots to them for 45 minutes, but that's a life choice. Netflix is also somewhat famous for paying absolutely stupid amounts of money. Even by Bay Area standards, they pay absolutely top of market. And as a result, this enables them to be highly selective in who they wind up hiring. Uh, they can screen not just for technical ability, but for good judgment. And that always amused me. You notice that of everything that Netflix talks about in their culture deck and other companies rip off and try to implement, they never steal this one? <laughs> I can't imagine why. And the third somewhat depressing one is that fundamentally that failure modes aren't quite the same <laughs> in different places. Uh, before I get a well actually from the audience during Q&A uh, by someone who works at Netflix, let 
Okay, yes, you also do original content. That's great. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet either. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is, is you're not being able to stream the latest episode is a bit different on the scale and between, from between that and the ATM is now showing everyone the wrong balance when you're trying to make a decision of do we take to the streets and burn down civilization. You'll note I don't say which is in which position on that spectrum. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is I've taken engineers out from all of those companies that I had on that slide for drinks, sometimes tea, sometimes adult tea. And <laughs> they complained the entire time about their environments. It turns out that no one's environment is perfect. Everything sucks. And no one talks about the bad parts. I tried to but the talk acceptance committee turned down my other talk proposal here. <laughs> they said it wasn't uplifting enough. They said it was too depressing. They said it was a terrible submission for a children's track. They don't have a children's track, and frankly, they're more than a little concerned that I had the temerity to show up after suggesting it. I digress. Our environments are all terrible because constraints shape our choices. We don't get to implement pure architecture in its archetypical form. Time, money, business models, we're all trying to do more with less the best that we can. And unless you're Travis Kalanick, the former CEO of Uber, no one shows up to work in the morning hoping to do a shitty job today. <laughs> we generally want to do a good job, but we all have constraints. And the point is that constraints shape our choices. The speaker on stage isn't going to talk about their own constraints, much less constraints that you may have in your environment they don't have visibility into. It's important to remember that the speaker on stage is human, unless they're Brendan Gregg, who is more <laughs> machine than man, twisted and evil. <laughs> but the point is that we're, we're telling stories from our environments as inspiration, not as a blueprint for what people should do. As a speaker here, we are fallible. But so are you. It's not always the speaker being a tech celebrity that is the problem here. Sometimes the danger comes from the audience. That's right, the don't you know who I am asshole might be one of you. I'll give you an example. Five years ago, I saw another terrific talk at a conference. It was a genuinely good talk about the merits of doing configuration management versus baking golden images and deploying it. And it was genuinely spectacular, not only because Docker hadn't been built yet and you didn't have a sea of smug assholes telling everyone that they're doing it wrong. So the speaker was from the Department of Energy and they admitted they were giving their first talk and they were sharing what they were doing around this at a large government department. And it went really well right up until the QA portion. You know, does anyone have any questions? And, and someone does, wonderful. Yes, you, sir, the condescending looking fellow in the back. Uh, what's your question? And the question was, that's not how we do it at Google. Let's unpack that short sentence like the remarkable bullshit onion that it is. This is multi-layered. In fact, let's divert entirely for a second. Interlude. <laughs> As a speaker, I have certain responsibilities that I have to fulfill. 
i have to write content that vaguely resembles what i said i would be talking about to some extent i have to show up on time and actually give the talk and most conferences worth attending these days have a remarkably strict must wear pants to give your talk policy <laughs> Jeez, enforcement on that one yeah and as an audience you have responsibilities too um including asking questions at the end when the speaker says, does anyone have any questions? Because if the answer is no, we're dying up here. So let me help you out with a list of things that aren't questions, such as calling bullshit on the entire premise of the talk. While remarkably accurate for most of my talks, still isn't a question. <laughs> and neither is telling a rambling, pointless story unless it's necessary to set up an actual question. And if it is, for God's sake, please be brief. And this one seems to come up at every conference, but your resume is never a question. <laughs> and what's remarkable is that that's not how we do it at Google. Hits all three of those in one sentence. <laughs> I have to assume that person worked on their compression algorithms. It's incredible. <laughs> I know a condescending engineer who worked at Google. Try to suspend your disbelief. I'd like to point out, again, this was the speaker's first talk, and he was visibly nervous. Like We all get nervous before talks, but this was actual knees shaking. It's, you're doing great. It's going to be okay. And I'm a little jealous, to be blunt, because no one ever tries that crap with my talks during the Q&A, because I love smacking back, but I don't get to do it. <laughs> Why don't people say that to me? Oh, that's right. I don't actually solve anyone's problems with my talks. Ah. <laughs> but I'd like to address the merit of that objection rather than the super shitty delivery. Do these two things look alike to anyone? <laughs> For those who don't know what the Department of Energy does, <laughs> like the moron who now runs it, <clears throat> it handles a lot of very important tasks that you really, really, really don't want them to screw up. Let's contrast. <laughs> Whereas Google's entire stated mission is to organize the world's information, sell ads against that information, and turn things off that people are actively using. <laughs> Good luck to those of you on Google Cloud. I'm sure that's going to end well. The point being is that these are very different problems being solved by very different people. But instead, just as, an, as, a, as, a, as a talk, we're going to give the, some jack wagon in the audience an undue amount of influence and credit simply because of who he is and where he works. And OK, now what? We're expecting the speaker to do what exactly? Change their talk on the fly? Hang on, let me edit my slide deck to re uh, reflect this new conclusion. I mean, that's my talk. Get your own. It, and the point isn't just about the speaker, it's what about the rest of the audience? What, what takeaway does that leave? Because just from that condescending statement, people are now generally throwing out a lot of the very good information that was just given about a nuanced story about how these things are handled at very large environments in government departments. And instead, they're going to focus on how some big tech company does this, devoid of any context or appreciation that their business models aren't running a giant search engine or turning things off that's widely beloved. The point is, is you're not these companies. And if you are, be very, very careful about punching down. I'm making fun of these companies. Yes, I get it, because all of them have succeeded. They, they've been, they're multi-billion dollar publicly traded companies. You can take it because you've won. Recognize the weight that your words carry. 
I'm not getting up here making fun of a five-person startup because that just makes me an asshole. I registered Twitter for pets.com just so I would have a mythical startup to make fun of in some of my talks and not be run out of town as I should be if I'm making fun of someone's actual labor of love. We don't have these companies' resources and we don't have their constraints. So trying to cargo cult their solutions devoid of anything approaching reasonable context is not a great idea. I mean, they do a lot of good work that many of us can leverage in our environments. But without the context of understanding where they fall down and what works and what doesn't, this work isn't going to magically solve what pain you're trying to solve. Stop pretending that it will. Case in point. <laughs> Simeon Army, uh, which contains Chaos Monkey, has been talked about at a number of conferences. Uh, for those who have been living in a cave for the last 10 years, it randomly kills AWS instances to validate that there are no single points of failure in an environment. It then expanded to kill other things, such as entire regions. Okay, great. Uh, this tested Netflix's failure, uh, failover capability, and they've been talking about it for years in condescending talks, just like this one. And they're rightly proud of it. And we've heard about it again and again. And we've all taken its lessons to heart. And we've all, in turn, completely eliminated single points of failure in our own environments. <laughs> if US Tire Fire 1 has an issue, all of our sites stay up. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. One service in one region went down earlier this year, and the entire internet shit itself to death. Instagram, American Airlines, AWS's own status page, all of them broke. And yes, Netflix stayed up. <laughs> In 2016, according to their annual report, Netflix spent $768 million on research and development for all of technology. So yeah, if you spend over three quarters of a billion dollars a year, you too can avoid two hour outages caused by weird issues here. Great, the rest of us weren't really that lucky. And this is okay. Most of the internet was impacted. Rearchitecting your entire stack to avoid a once every seven years black swan two hour outage during which most of the internet was down could very easily double or triple your costs. And if you're running something where people's lives are put at risk, yeah, you probably should not cost cut on those things. If you're running Twitter for pets, maybe that two hours of downtime is okay. Maybe the internet is better when you're down. <laughs> yeah, and that's okay. The point of my talk is subtitled Danger, the Danger of Celebrity and Tech. I'm not here to talk about dangers to your technical environment because honestly I don't care. <laughs> The reason I'm here and I want to, what I want to talk about is talk about the dangers to us and to you as people. Remember the human, the whole idea of DevOps rather than being a uh, way to get a 30% raise by changing your job title is about people, humanity, culture, empathy. These are important things. You wind up with some tech celebrity who gets on stage and then who just spends 45 minutes shitting all over this thing you're really proud of and you feel like crap. And you shouldn't, because you built a thing that solves your problems, and it works for you. Remember, they're getting up on stage and talking about this, this aspirational approach to one angle of something they've done that they've invested tremendous amounts of time in. There are still problems everywhere. I'd be shocked if that speaker from the Department of Energy got up and gave that talk again after Google Bro was done asking his ridiculous question. I want to believe that he did, but as a speaker myself, it's hard. Getting up here to talk about a thing is scary. And if someone craps all over it your first time out speaking, it is unthinkable to get back up and try it again. It's like stand-up comedy, only instead of, you're not funny, get off the stage, it's, ha <laughs> your entire life's work is invalid, fuck on out of here. It, it doesn't help. 
And this is the challenge I have with a lot of technical talks. If you see a great talk on Kubernetes or agnostic provisioning, or I don't even know what's coming around the corner, serverless maybe, it's great, but think about the context behind this. It, like, what are the speak? What is the speaker showing you? What aren't they showing you? It helps to remember that they're not you. A lot of really interesting technology that's being actively discussed right now is fascinating technically, but I struggle to see the point of it from a business perspective. I thought we learned back in 2000 and 2001 that this is really cool is not a sustainable business model. There has to be something beyond that. And then I realized how many companies in San Francisco don't make a, pro make a profit or even care about that sort of thing. And I realized, oh, I'm the deranged one. Never mind. <laughs> Other side of it. When you see a terrible talk that misses the point and couldn't possibly ever work, OK. Are you sure it's just completely wrong globally in every scenario? Or is it just wrong for your use case and your problem space? I find that in either situation, it generally helps to put yourself in the other person's shoes. If the roles were reversed, and you see the speaker sweating bullets, great. Ooh, that, that probably feels really uncomfortable. Throw in a softball question that they should be easy to answer that isn't condescending and challenging their entire right to be there. Be kind. And if someone asks a ridiculous question, I, I joke, but generally calling them out in the middle of the stage is generally not a great plan. When you're the person with the microphone, it's real easy to go too far. The secret here is that tech isn't about tech, and I don't think it ever has been. There's strong elements to it, but fundamentally, we're all here at a conference rather than staring at screens. Well, OK. But <laughs> we're all here at a conference for the people. It's not because we don't wheel computers out and they start demonstrating ridiculous things as the main entertainment. It, it's, a, it's a means to telling a story. That's what conference talks are. Tech's about the people. And regardless of what side of the stage you're on, I firmly believe you should never leave a talk feeling shitty. My name's Corey Quinn. This has been Don't You Know Who I Am. And if anyone has questions, I am thrilled to answer any of them. But I'm just going to put this up while you do that. <laughs>My question is, why is there an extra N in your Twitter handle? An extra N? Yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Because I can't proofread and I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did this at 2 o'clock in the morning. What's great is, in the speaker lounge, I'm testing this. I specifically designed this yellow not to be Amazon's trademark orange, because lawyers. And on the test projector, this thing looks bright Amazon orange. And it's like, oh dear, this is not going to go well. Turns out, crappy test projector. But bullet dodged on that. I was, I was more busy, I was busy freaking out about that than you know, spelling my own name properly. Please. Good option, the N plus one anyway. Exactly. I failed to have a test. You're right. Oh, oh my god. Yeah, and that's a better answer. Can I rewind that and say, yeah, N plus one. Thank you. Good, good, good. Other questions, snarky commentary. I'll even accept someone's resume if necessary. Oh, yeah. What's the matter with you is also a perfectly valid question to ask me in this context. So I'm not even sure this is a question, but it feels like this is almost like how a talk on how to attend conferences to filter out the bullshit and not be a dick to people on the stage. Um, huh. Any ideas on how to just socialize this? Good question. Um, it started. The question was effectively, how do I how do I socialize being a good conference attendee? Um, and the answer, in some respects, is this talk itself, because I found that walking up to people, so Ted, you were a massive asshole in the Q and A. What's up with that? Turns out that puts people on the defensive. <laughs> Who knew? Whereas when I put a story like this up, everyone, even Ted sitting there who really needs to learn this can think, oh, well, he's probably talking about all those other people. That's fine. It, 
it gives a veneer of plausible deniability. How you start telling that story beyond that, I mean, there are people who do need to be taken aside and gently at first and then not so gently later on have this explained to them. But it's, it's a good question. Uh, changing culture is hard, as it turns out. It's, so what are you hoping to do? I'm hoping to change the culture of my company. Cool. Are you going to fire everyone? Because that's the only way to do it easily. Other than that, it's going to take work and effort. I was going to say uh, thank you for this. Uh, as one of the people who d also works at a Department of Energy uh, facility, mm -hmm. uh, coming to Lisa is always interesting because I get to feel like, oh, wow, we are 10 years behind everyone else. But knowing that, like, maybe we're not as bad as everyone, you know, because the thing is, like, you know, we have seven people on my team and we don't have the resources. So we're we're trying and we're but we don't we don't use containers yet. We don't, you know, but it, it just takes time to change, especially in, when there's a lot of legacy and. You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You do important work. And it's easy to listen to the bullshit coming out of the bay where it's, ooh, if you're not containers, ha ha, what is this? Last year, it's Kubernetes now. It, okay. It, the best thing is, so why are you migrating to Kubernetes? And they'll tell a beautiful story that rambles and goes in all kinds of different pointless ways. And then you apply the subtext filter. And it's, we have a new CIO who we didn't confiscate the in-flight magazine from. They saw the right thing. Someone threw in a Gartner magic quadrant, and here we are. Okay. There's a hype cycle that drives some of these things. And there is value to that, because when, you, when other people find out where the sharp edges are, you, you'd see that in context where it doesn't matter, because the worst thing they're going to do is, well, turn off Google Reader. But in context where there's a bit where the government division, you don't have the luxury of, yeah, we're just going to screw around with the nukes with this new technology. I wrote it last night to production with it. Please tell me that doesn't happen. I, oh, okay. Well, we don't I, do it. But I was going to say, the one thing I would tell, try to tell people, because you know, I have a lot of friends in the Bay Area and that who work these companies, but I point out, like, uh, at seven or so, I go home and then don't think about work till the next day. I don't have an on call. I get like 24 vacation days a year. So you know, it's it's a different thing. I, and I don't have to feel like, oh God, I just broke something and I just lost us millions of dollars. It's right. Well, less let me hear stress. You say, Counterpoint: I spend eight dollars for a cup of coffee and I'm sad all the time. So there. <laughs> your your weather is better, but you know. <laughs> Thank you. So from the standpoint of, I'm sure there are some people in this audience who actually are on PCs putting together conference programs. Is it actually a problem when too many of the people who get invited to speak are basically people who work for the big origins and are basically talking about what no other shop in the world is going to be able to do that isn't one of those? That's a great question, and I think it's going to come down to what the conference in particular is. Um, I was at my first SRE con uh, this past year, a few, about a couple months ago in Dublin, and it was great, but it felt like half of the attendees were working at Google. It got to a point of, oh, what do you do? Oh, I work on GCP. Of course you do. And it was interesting talking to finding people who didn't work for one of those giant corporations. The, and yeah, there does turn into this idea of, OK, this is the fifth talk. I've heard about Kubernetes, and none of us can spell it, so that's kind of awesome. <laughs> Great, but I'm still not hearing the business value. And it, it starts with, the, again, it comes down to the context and the constraints. Well, first, let's pretend we have several tens of thousands of people who, over the last 20 years, have built this amazing infrastructure that everything is just an API call away. And you're sitting there in your in your data center trying to figure out why something isn't booting. And eight hours later, you realize, oh, that was a bad network cable. And oh, but yeah, that whole API-driven thing sounds awesome. Maybe next year. And and you feel bad about it. And you shouldn't, because none of us, generally speaking, have that, have those things until they're built. So having people running ahead and telling stories from the future is handy. It gives guideposts and terrible warnings that you can pick up from. The other side of that coin, though, is you wind up like it's 
at three o'clock this morning and I'm sleeping, I don't want the door kicked off the hinges by some hype evangelist. Wake up, the future's here, asshole. We're, everything is serverless now. Wait, wait, what? What time is it? Who are, how do you get in my house? And it just turns into this whole battle of, yeah, everything you just finally finished by moving the containers? Yeah, throw that shit away, Slappy, because the future has changed again. It. I don't see the value behind these things. I mean, it's interesting from a technical perspective and for very specific use cases, but yes, run your ATM network on top of AWS Lambda. <laughs> what? Yeah. So I think uh, building on that last example, there's a thing I see happen a lot more often at security conferences where somebody will present an idea that might not just be bad for people in uh, different situations, but might be might turn out to be bad for almost everyone and legitimately dangerous. And then somebody will come up to the mic and totally eviscerate them in a horrible way. Um, do you have any strategies for maybe eviscerating them in a less horrible way? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, yeah, this is the problem. People put me on stage and ask open-ended, open mic questions. I respond entirely too honest. You're right. You're absolutely right, and my answer is, and I'm not kidding, I don't go to security conferences because they're toxic shitholes. Since you asked, you know, I don't have a good answer for that. Every, every, there are spectacular tech talks coming out of it, but the culture is horrifying. So that is my answer, and yeah, opting out is kind of a weird thing to do, especially if your entire career has been in the security space. Well, just don't show up. That's not really viable. I mean, again, I work historically in cloud stuff, which means security is something we'll bolt on later, eventually. <laughs> it's the best kind of problem, someone else's. Yeah. See, if I tell that joke at RSA, they're not going to laugh. <laughs> Hi. Um, you've done a great service for all of us on you know, how to actually int interpret all of the stuff that we hear in conferences, so thank you for that. And I don't work for any of those companies that you mentioned. No, those people are waiting for me outside in the parking lot after this talk. <laughs> it, yeah. But I do want to point out that uh, one of the other talks that I saw yesterday from, I think it was like US Digital Services, there, uh, one of these tech companies, ex-employees, have actually made a difference by not only commenting on things, but actually going and fixing things, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just, just wanted to uh, you know, shout out to them on if you're in a tech company and if you want to fix the government, actually go there and actually do something about it. Don't just make a comment about it. Right, right. yes, yeah. you're absolutely right. It's easy thing in the world like, aha, oh, you're at the Department of Energy, your stuff is bullshit. Yeah, it's, it's cheap words. So I'm gonna come over and help you fix it is a terrific counterpoint to that. Um, I mean, I'm still waiting for a team of Googlers to descend on Twitter for pets and fix a lot of those infrastructure problems, but instead they just cast shade and wait for me in the parking lot. I think this was an excellent talk. Thank you for Thank you. for giving it. It's a lot of great perspective. One area that has happened here this week, um, not to me, is although it's happened here to me in previous years, is you'll start talking to people as the hallway track, which is a lot of great value in swapping ideas, and you'll explain some of your constraints to people, and the answer is seriously, oh, you're screwed. Just quit your job and go somewhere else. And that's not actually productive. Um, it wasn't productive to the person who came for the first time this year either, who is an attendee and now maybe is scared to ask their questions. And I was wondering if maybe you could touch a little bit on like the attendee to attendee interactions that maybe also have an impact, but in a slightly different way. You don't need to be on stage to have impact with your words. And when you come and talk to someone who, oh, well at my company, we already solved this problem six months ago. So yeah, it's really hard, give up and quit is not useful or constructive. One of my first hallway track experiences at a conference was when I was tra tackling uh, an LDAP problem. Um, but I, yeah, LDAP problem is redundant. But <laughs> I was beating my head against the wall and I was talking to someone and he's like, oh yeah, we just looked through that six months ago. Yeah, let me save you some time. You're gonna try this, it's gonna break. You're gonna try this, it's gonna break. You're gonna contemplate just quitting and going to raise goats, then you're going to get through to the other side and here's the solution that'll work. 
Yeah, I didn't have trouble justifying going to a conference for the rest of my time at that job. It was the sort of thing that you pick up from people who have been there and done that. But it was given with an eye towards this is how you deal with the constraints you have, and this is how you evolve past it and solve your problem. Not, well, it sounds like your environment's a tire fire. <laughs> Good luck, asshole. <laughs> I mean, that's not helpful or constructive. It, all of the, every, I've not yet seen a problem at this conference or any conference this year that is not somehow solvable. It just is a question of how you approach it and how you look at it. I don't think a viable solution to technical tire fires is for everyone to quit and go work at Google. It turns out there are, you need to be really condescending to do that and not everyone is good at that. <laughs> Another fantastic talk. I've always enjoyed yours. Since we have a couple minutes left, can you uh, maybe outline what other technologies you're calling bullshit on? Oh, God. oh good Lord. <laughs> <sighs> That's the fun part. Which technologies am I calling bullshit on? Uh, to be very honest, all of them. They are all hilariously bad, and there are ways you can break them. There is no perfect technology since maybe the wheel but that it causes ruts, and never mind, the wheel is flawed too. Um, if you're referring to my old talk about uh, making fun of the hype of Docker, 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 yeah, that, that was two generations ago. Then it was Kubernetes, 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 that doesn't roll off the tongue. And now you have serverless, which is my new uh, whipping pony. The, and the reason this stuff is funny to me is because it, you look at some of these things and it's, it's easy to pervert them past the point of sense into doing hilariously terrible things. Uh, one of my uh, seminal talks that I really enjoyed giving was terrible ideas in Git. Um, <laughs> and the reason I gave that, in all seriousness, was I didn't know Git very well. So, okay, well, I'm a mediocre white guy in tech, so I'm gonna get up on stage and pretend teach it to people, then no one will question me. Yeah, it turns out that, yes, people will question you if you say things that are provably untrue. And, but more to the point, when you speak about something in depth and technical in this, when I built my Docker talk, for example, it very quickly turned into, I don't understand these things, to getting schooled rapidly and then being told, oh, that, that does change how this works. Okay, that's still a giant problem, but now it's a giant problem I understand much better. And it, it improved these, the entire approach. I mean, there, everyone is going to have their own sacred cow technology that they think is beautiful. Um, no joke, for a long time, one of mine was Postfix. Um, around the same time as I was deeply into FreeBSD, don't worry, I got better. And again, and that's part of it too, is another common pattern we see is, um, uh, it's like, oh, so what language is your app written in? PHP or JavaScript and oh, those languages are easy to learn and very approachable. Let me tell you why you're a fool. And it, it just, it's a super toxic response. I'm, it's one of those things I'm starting to check myself on. It's, I am, let's be blunt here, an absolutely awful programmer. It, I can pretty much get something that works and then I hand it to someone good who looks at this, oh, honey, no. <laughs> and they fix it for me. Once upon a time, I was one of the early um, Debian packagers for SaltStack, and I had no idea how to build a Debian package, so I did it badly. And then I showed it to Debian developers, and then I wasn't allowed to build Debian packages anymore. <laughs> if you want something done, do it terribly. It, no, and this, my point, I guess, getting back to the culture angle, is that crapping all over someone for the technology they choose to use, it's a bad look. I'm very careful when I point out at these things to, for, when I'm making fun of serverless and Kubernetes and all the rest, it's not that, oh, you're choosing to learn them so you're stupid. No, it's, they are interesting technologies, but they're A, needs to be a business value, and B, it's not this magic panacea you can just sprinkle on to every problem that you have because every problem is not a fit for these technologies. There are no global solutions in tech past maybe, well, have you tried using computers? <laughs> Everything past that bifurcates, and there are no universal laws around this stuff. Great question, though. Anyone else? Questions, commentary, snark, your resume? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you all for coming.